Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our weekly mentoring hour. We keep this time open to all, uh, to all to ask questions, share thoughts, discuss, or clarify on any topics that's in your mind or you're interested in. Before we could start with the session, can I request one of us to please lead us in prayer? Kiran, can I request you to lead us in prayer? Yes, ma'am, sir. Thank you. Father, we want to just say thank you, Father God. Father God, thanking you for the day, Father God. Thanking you once again we get together once again before you throne, Father God, to discuss in your word, Father God, to knowledge, Father God. Father God, help us to understand all, all the question and sections, Father God, and uh, give more desire and present to your kingdom work, Father God. Father God, thanking you, Father God, to all things, Father God. Father God, those students willing to join, Father God, help them to join uh, the section, Father God. Thanking you all. Upcoming time, I'm just submitting to your hand, Father God. Take care of everything. Almighty Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Kiran. So um, please feel free to post your questions on chat or you can also unmute and ask your questions. Okay, we have received a question from John Paul. While Jesus was ministering on earth, he operated with Holy Spirit. Did he also had power to forgive sins before crucifixion? Uh, is there any of our faculty who would like to explain or take up this question, please? Um, yes, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, John. So, um, so Jesus, um, before, uh, so uh, in his incarnation, uh, he didn't cease being God, right? So he was fully, go he was fully God, fully man, fully God by origin. That that's who he was, and he never ceased being God. And yet, as a man, he had laid aside his powers of deity, his, that is the omniscience, the omnipotence, and the omnipresence. But he didn't cease being God. He's still God, but he just laid aside those powers in heaven. That's Philippians 2, uh, 7 through 11, uh, tells us about that. So he's still God. And uh, so, yes, he did have the authority to forgive sins before his crucifixion on the same basis uh, on which sins were dealt with prior to the cross. That is, uh, in the Old Testament, the Bible tells us the sin, their sins were covered and God could uh, overlook their sins because of the cross that was coming up. So just as Jesus healed people, before the cross, on the basis of what he would do on the cross. He also forgave sins before the cross on the basis of what he would was going to do on the cross. So on both those counts, the fact that he was still God, and secondly, he was going to pay for the sins of the whole world, uh, he had the authority to uh, forgive sins before his crucifixion. Is that okay, John? Welcome. Okay, to answer your question, John, thank you. Okay, now we have another question from Kiran. Can you explain once the book of Galatians 3, chapter 3, verse 13 and 14, and 29, verse 29? 
Meanwhile, I'll just also post this. Any of a faculty would like to take this uh, question and explain? Pastor Nancy. Yes, uh, yes please yeah, go ahead. I'll, I'll try to do that. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah. So yeah, thank you, Kiran, for that question. So uh, in this passage, we see that, um, uh, you know, Christ Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Uh, we know, you know, how he did this. He did this by um, hanging on the cross. And uh, scriptures also say that, you know, someone who's who hung on a cross was uh, cursed. Um, so Jesus, you know, went to that extent to uh, forgive us and redeem us, you know, purchase us back and release uh, heaven's blessings on our lives. Now, uh, in the verses that you have mentioned, Kiran, we are told that uh, because Jesus has done this for us, the blessing of Abraham, okay, the blessing of Abraham uh, can come upon uh, the Gentiles in Christ Jesus. Okay, and also uh, verse 29 there says that uh, um, we are, if we are in Christ, then we are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Um, we know that God blessed Abraham. He made a covenant with Abraham uh, and the things of Abraham were, uh, you know, friendship with God, protection from his enemies. God promised him prosperity. God promised him, you know, um, a future. Uh, now, uh, because of our faith in Christ Jesus, uh, the blessings of Abraham come upon us uh, because we are children, you know, spiritually, we are um, children of Abraham. So, you know, we also uh, receive those blessings. So I think I'll just stop with that. If anyone else wants to add, uh, they could also add, please. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, any other faculty would like to add to what Pastor Nancy said? Add to this. Kiran, did that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. I Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Okay, we have another question from Herbert. Uh, I would like to know the difference between justification, sanctification. Another common term like that uh, they normally ask concerning that I have. Okay, uh, okay. So here we see that Herbert is asking, you would like to know the difference between justification and sanctification. Uh, yes, any of our faculty would like to take this up? Uh, Paul, you would like to take this question? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Diana. Uh, thank you for the question, Herbert. Uh, just briefly, uh, uh, justification. Uh, I, I'm sure we, a lot of us have heard this uh, uh, phrase when we think of justification, which is just as if we haven't sinned. So when we are in Christ, we and we accept the Lord Jesus in our uh, in our heart, and we have become a believer. We can stand in front of God's presence just as if we have not sinned, and that is justification, and right? uh, not because of any works that we have done, but because of the cross, because of what Jesus did on the cross. And sanctification is now, if we look at the Old Testament, uh, uh, the sacrifices was only covering sins. Uh, and and now in the New Testament, uh, the 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 what Jesus did, he cleanses us from sin. So sanctification is a process uh, that we all are going through. We are sanctified. Yes, God has you know uh, paid the price. He has washed us. He has sanctified us. Uh, but it's also a process where you know uh, uh, where we have to ask forgiveness. And uh, you know we all make mistakes I I during our walk. With, uh, during our Christian walk, and and so we make mistakes, and then we can we ask God, God cleanse me, uh, make me more like you, and so 
uh, sanctification is a process and we go through it uh, every day uh, uh, in our Christian work. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I would like any other uh, faculty also to please add to this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Herbert, did that answer your question or is there any follow-up question? Yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, it has answered my question. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes. Another time I'm forgetting it, but I think it's like purification. I, I, I think I remember it very well, but I, it rhymes with that. It's, it's the same one. The same in, is in the same line with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Herbert. Yeah. So uh, let's take this time to ask questions. Like you can also ask questions based on the course that you're studying. If there's any doubt or any clarifications needed, you can unmute and ask, or you can post it on the chat, please. Any questions? Or is there anything that you would like to discuss or share a thought? Please feel free to take this time. OK. Abhishek has a question. He has posted uh, the anointing in the heart and anointing for the service. Are there any different? Yes. Uh, can I request our faculty to take this up? Uh, Jean, would you like to take this up? Uh, hi, Dana. I'm, I'm not sure if I'm very clear okay, on okay. this. Sorry. Okay. 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 Thanks, Jean. Sorry. Um, yes, uh, Paul or Pastor Nancy can take this question uh, okay so abhishek um, uh, the anointing in the heart uh, in other words uh, you know the the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit um, in each believer. We know that we have the indwelling presence of the Holy Spirit uh, when we are born again. So every believer uh, in, in that sense, you know, carries the anointing uh, in, in us, within us. And we know uh, the reference from 1 John 2.27, um, which uh, says that, um, you know, the, the Holy Spirit uh, in us, the anointing in us, uh, uh, that he will teach us all things. So uh, the Holy Spirit, um, he brings and imparts everything, uh, you know, that we need while he dwells in us. Now, uh, the anointing upon us, it's more like, as you have clearly mentioned here, for service. Okay, for service as in it empowers us to do uh, the will of God, the purpose, the, the purpose of God. Uh, and we read about, um, you know, the, uh, this anointing being manifested in so many uh, different ways in scripture. We see in the Old Testament how, um, you know, the anointing came upon people uh, to be prophets and they prophesied the word of God. It came upon kings to, to lead God's people uh, uh, according to his purpose and again you know in the in the new testament we know that the lord jesus ministered with the anointing we see his life um that it was uh, like god confirmed whatever he spoke uh, with the signs wonders and miracles that he did um during his ministry and it didn't stop there you know, this empowering anointing we see this carried on in the uh, early church as well through the lives of the apostles through the lives of uh, um, you know believers at that time um and uh, the same kind of works the supernatural works are released um, we see uh, healings deliverances but we also you know, hear of unusual miracles that took place because of the anointing one wonderful example is um, 
from Acts chapter 19, you know, when uh, uh, handkerchiefs and aprons were taken um, from Paul, um, uh, from uh, Paul's body, and then you you find that people were being delivered even through that, and uh, that's that's called as an unusual miracle, uh, which which uh, was done because of the anointing of God. So the empowering of God is to do the the uh, work of God with the power of God, and uh, that is the anointing for service. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll uh, leave it at that. And if others would like to add, uh, others also can add. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, Pastor, you would like to add anything to it? Uh, no, Nancy was good. I, I, I yes. was taking notes when she was speaking. So that's the summary of our sermon. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Thanks, Nancy. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. And there is a follow up question from Abhishek. How a person can receive this anointing for the service? Uh, Pastor Nancy, you would like to continue to explain this because you started up very well. Okay. Okay, oh, Diana, how can this person, how can a person receive this anointing for service? Um, so the way we see it uh, in scripture, uh, Abhishek, and also Pastor shared uh, here, I uh, shared that uh, the Holy Spirit within us, right? He teaches us, guides us, transforms us. Uh, but for us to uh, do the works uh, of God, uh, Jesus asked his disciples to tarry or wait for the baptism in the Holy Spirit. So uh, we, we see that, you know, he speaks to them in Acts chapter uh, 1, verse 8, and he talks about, you know, the Holy Spirit coming upon the people and then, you know, them being witnesses uh, um, in their city and, and all over the world. Uh, and Acts chapter 2, it happened you know, on the day of Pentecost. The, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon, um, uh, upon those 120 gathered in the upper room. And then on, you know, we, we see how they start um, uh, giving witness to the, to the resurrection power of Christ uh, and start doing the works very similar to Jesus during his lifetime and ministry. So uh, uh, to answer your question, how can a person receive this anointing, the 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 first thing I want to say is the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the baptism in the Holy Spirit is what uh, will will um, it'll immerse us in that power, and then we are able to release that power. And of course, you know, this anointing uh, we we can grow and increase this anointing as we yield, um, you know, more and more to God. So then, you know, comes in uh, our our communion with God. We can add things like prayer worship time in the word uh, you know meditating on the word of god understand as we as we release the power of the word uh, in our lives you know all of these things will will strengthen that anointing and then you know uh, we also need to um, allow the the holy spirit to uh, release the gifts of the spirit we read about that paul writes in uh, first corinthians chapter 12 we have nine gifts listed there uh, and by and we understand that these these gifts are manifested by faith so you know i'd also like to add that so baptism in the holy spirit uh, then you know us uh, aligning ourselves and communing with god with you know, prayer uh, worship and uh, all of that and uh, in addition to that faith Okay, when we when we walk with faith, we're able to release the gifts of the spirit. Um, so yeah, Abhishek, uh, in all of these ways, we can we can uh, receive the anointing and release the anointing. Okay, your question is only about receive, but yeah, yeah. I, I hope that answers your question, Abhishek. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, thank Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Nancy, for the detailed explanation, and thanks, Abhishek, for the question. Um, thank you. Uh, so, yes, we keep this time open. You can feel free to ask any questions. You can post it on the chat. Yeah. Uh, there is a question from Zeli. I'm a bit confused because I used to have what I learned from one minister. Okay, there is a question uh, regarding ministering healing. Uh, 
Yeah, I, I keep this open to any of our faculty to take up this question of Zelatoli. Where it says, is it normal to have some kind of pain in some part of the body or a sensation while ministering, healing to the sick? Uh, just a quick answer. Yes, Pastor. Zelatoli. Um, the answer is... Uh, uh, there's nothing wrong in uh, in uh, having physical sensations while you're ministering, um, and that's just a, that's one of the ways you receive words of knowledge. So, uh, um, and and uh, the thing is, for example, uh, somebody uh, in the audience may have example. I'm just saying this example may have pain in their um, right elbow. Right. So what happens now? The Holy Spirit can inf give us that word of knowledge in many ways. Right. One is it could come as a picture of a person's elbow and you see it's the right side. So that's one way it can come. Sometimes the words right elbow pain can come up in our spirit. Um, sometimes you may see something visual on, you know, uh, on that person's body, like you may see some dark thing here on that person's body. That's one another way the Holy Spirit can let you know that person that there's there's there are people who have pain in the elbow. And uh, another way is that you may feel in your body a physical sensation right here around the skull. So right and now that physical sensation is just a temporary pain. It's not like it's not your pain. No, it's not a pain that's attaching itself to your body. It's just a sensation here in that part of your body that, that God is using to let us know that that's the condition he's healing. Just as God can use our mind, like visuals, pictures, just as God can use our spirit, that's words coming out of our spirit, the things we see in our spirit, or just as so, so also God can use our physical body to communicate to us. So to answer your question, there's nothing wrong. You know, it's a very temporal thing. It's like you just feel it and then it's gone. And many times we actually miss it, you know, because we we are not paying attention and the, the sensation comes and goes. And we don't know that the Holy Spirit is trying to get our attention that, look, I'm, I'm a, I want to heal people with this kind of a condition. And so actually many times we miss it. Um, uh, and of course, we must not misinterpret it in the sense uh, in the sense that if I previously had pain in my right elbow, then I would not consider that because, you know, I, I already had pain in my body uh, before that. Then that's something I would need to ask God for healing and I would, you know, need to resist and uh, believe God for healing in my own body. So as long as I didn't have pain before in my right elbow, and I'm feeling getting a sensation there, then that's an indication. That's one of the ways the Holy Spirit can use to tell me that, to give me a word of knowledge. Um, yeah, so that's how I would respond to that. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, Zeli, did that answer your question or is there a follow-up question? Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Zeli. Uh, yes. We're waiting for the next question. Oh, would you like to unmute or you can post it on the chat? Okay, we have another question regarding the Holy Spirit from Monica. How does the Holy Spirit speak to the team? Could it happen? Like a Holy Spirit puts different or opposite things in the heart of people among the team. If it's so, how could it be recognized? It's the right direction. Okay, I keep Monica's question open to our faculty team. If anyone would like to pick this question and explain it to Monica or clarify it. Um, yeah, Monica, a, a very, uh, um, you know, a very uh, good illustration is that in Acts 13 verses 1, 2, and 3, where, you know, uh, there was a team there in the church at Antioch. Uh, there were about five spiritual elders and they were praying just worshiping god ministering to the lord and while they were ministering to the lord the holy spirit spoke now the passage there in acts 13 1 to 3 doesn't tell us how the holy spirit spoke 
Um, so we know the normal ways, um, meaning he could come as a it could come as a word of prophecy through a person. It could come as a vision that somebody had. It could come as uh, yeah you know, uh, 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 something that maybe more than one person saw and so on. But uh, we do have guidance in the scripture on uh, uh, on that uh, you know that everything that's inspired has to be tested. So First Thessalonians chapter five, uh, I think it's verse just twenty one. I think it is. It says, um, "Test all things. Do not despise prophecies. Uh, 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 do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophecies. Test all things. Hold on to what is good, right? So we have to test everything, even if it comes to a group. Uh, and that's why in First Corinthians fourteen, uh, it says, you know, when two or three prophets speak, let the others judge." So that means even if there is a team of people ministering, uh, it has to be judged. Uh, somebody has to check, okay, is that really from God or not from God? So the, the point is everything has to be tested. You know, even if it's a group ministry, it has to be tested. And the others are listening and testing all things, right? So, uh, so is it possible that in a group, the Holy Spirit may be revealing things that are which seem opposite. Uh, it's possible, you know, if, for example, if there are four people who are praying and saying, God, uh, show us which way to go. Maybe the Holy Spirit wants two of them to go left and he wants the other two to go right. So in that case, two go left and two go right. You know, the people who received, uh, that's okay. You know, that's, that's his direction at that moment uh, for two people to go one way and for two to go another way and do the work of the ministry. And that's, that's fine. So, um, but but all of that has to be tested, right? So the two people who feel they're called by God to go left, they need to test that. And once they validate it, then they go left. The other two who feel that they're supposed to go right, they test it and then they go right. right? So, um, so to answer your question, uh, uh, you know, yes, anything is possible uh, when the Holy Spirit speaks. Right? We can't put him in a box. Uh, but everything has to be tested uh, and judged. Uh, but definitely the Holy Spirit cannot speak anything that contradicts his word. Right? First John 5 verse 7, it says the spirit and the word agree. You know, so uh, the Holy Spirit will not say anything that contradicts the word. So if there are two people, a, a team, and uh, two are saying, you know, there are two different voices, uh, we have to make sure that it's all, first of all, aligned with the written scriptures. Then if it is a subjective thing, like, you know, which way to go, which place to go and minister, what, then, you know, um, the people who receive the word, they pray about it. And uh, then, you know, it's possible that maybe one group goes to one part of one city, another group goes to another city, and that's fine. You know, and we see examples of that, I think, in Acts uh, uh, 16, uh, when Paul, you know, he intended to go to Asia Minor, that is... Uh, Mm, now more um, he, in the Turkey, in modern day Turkey is going up north and westwards. Uh, but that was what he wanted to do. But the Holy Spirit said, no, go east, go to Macedonia. That means you go across the agency and into Europe. That's how the Holy Spirit uh, led them. And so uh, they went with that. Uh, I'm not sure if I answered your question. If you have a follow-up question, you're welcome to ask Monica. It's clear now, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Monica, for that question. Uh, yes, we have another question from Sukkenu. Let me just read that. Uh, because of red light. Or, uh, okay, Pastor, you would like to take up Sid's question, Pastor? Yeah, said, um, yeah, uh, can so the basic question, can resurrection happen today? Uh, the answer is yes. You know, uh, the Lord Jesus, uh, God still uh, raises uh, people uh, up today. Uh, in Acts 26, uh, verse 8, you know, the Apostle Paul said, why should it be thought a thing incredible that God should raise the dead? Yeah, so God hasn't changed. 
so he still raises the dead. So the answer to your question is, yeah, it does. Um, the only thing is I would be very careful on the kind of things we watch on video, YouTube, uh, you know, because we need to know what is genuine and what is uh, just uh, created by nice uh, video, <laughs> uh, video, you know, um, by a nice media team. And sadly, even in the Christian world, uh, there are people who take advantage of a lot of things, and they uh, they uh, they they pretend that or what do you call it? What's the right word? They imitate uh, these supernatural things. So, one hand, yes, we know there is the genuine, but we have to be careful of the Christian world where things are manufactured. You know, and uh, because there's a lot of video technology and all these things can be manufactured, made to look like real. And uh, and it's all, all of course, is done because people are trying to become famous, get crowds to come and so on and so forth. So, uh, and there's just been numerous cases of those kinds of things happening where uh, sometimes they even pay sick people to come, uh, you know, and pretend that they've been healed and all these things are happening in the Christian church. So we just have to be careful about that. And uh, yeah, that's how I would uh, respond to that. Thank you, Pastor. Sid, did that answer your question or do you have a follow-up question? No, ma'am. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Thank you, Sid, for that question. Uh, yes, we uh, keep this uh, session open to all our students. Please feel free to ask questions. Okay, we have another question from Zeli. I heard that the presence of the demonic spirit have some form of foul smell. Is it true? Or... So how can a believer differentiate between the presence of God and the presence of the dem demonic spirit? Yeah, uh, I keep this open. Uh, Pastor, you would like to answer this question, please? Um, so um, the answer to your question, Zaltoli, is yes. You know, uh, demonic spirits can, the presence of demonic spirits can be determined uh, through a foul smell, right? But it's not always. Um, just as the presence of God, there are so the, the presence. You know, if you talk about the presence, the manifestation of the presence of God, the the, the recognition of God's presence can happen in many different ways. One of the ways is aroma, sweet smell, and sometimes there are different kinds of smell that are actually indicate what God wants to do. Pleasant smells. And so that's one side, right? And but again, the presence of God is not always uh, may become doesn't always become tangible by aroma or by smell. Uh, sometimes, in the similar way, uh, demonic spirits, in some cases, not always, but in some cases, uh, their presence becomes known through a foul smell. Uh, what is the the best, the right way to know uh, demonic spirits? Of course, it's uh, one is through the discerning of spirits, right? That is uh, the gift of the discerning of spirits, uh, which we know. Uh, so that the Holy Spirit helps us recognize that there is an evil spirit at work. Uh, secondly, uh, 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 if, if the gift of the discerning of spirits is not operating, then we just use plain discernment, which is our own spiritual ability to recognize demonic presence, which is based on the word of God and the, um, the expressions of what's happening. You know, Jesus said in Matthew 7, by the fruit you will know them. So when you look at what's the expressions, uh, sometimes um, it's not the gift of the discerning of spirits, but it's just our own spiritual discernment that enables us to recognize that uh, there is a demonic spirit at work. Right. So uh, uh, you know, when you look at the outward expressions, I mean, how the behavior or what is happening, then you know, you know obviously that's demonic. Uh, and uh, that's evil. And so then uh, the the test, the test, uh, I mean, th there are several tests, but the very basic test is, you know, Paul writes in First Corinthians 12, uh, no man speaking by the Spirit of God can say Jesus is Lord, right? So that's a basic test. Mm. Uh, if Jesus Christ is recognized as Lord and exalted as the God, the only Lord, then 
God, that's the presence of God, God is at work. If Jesus Christ is denied as the Lord, then that's obviously the work of demonic spirits, right? Um, is that okay, Zalatholi? There is a follow-up question from Zalatholi, Pastor. Where is that? Uh, ah. Sorry, not from Zelitoli, from Herbert. Oh. I also heard that the demons normally move at night, especially at 3 a.m. How far does that go? Uh, Herbert, my response would be demons are working 24 7. You know, and just remember 3 a.m. in one part of the world is, you know, 3 p.m. in another part of the world. <laughs> so I, I wouldn't pay too, too much attention to those kinds of statements. Okay, Pastor, uh, I know there's a question from Charles, but there's also a follow-up question from Kiran. Kiran saying, uh, can demons affect our dreams? Uh, okay. Yeah, the answer is yes. Mm, uh, so uh, demons can interject, uh, you know, uh, things into the dreams of a believer you know, what causing uh, wrong dreams or false dreams or nightmares and so on. Uh, that's if the believer has given an opportunity for demons to do that. That is, uh, you know, uh, they, they, demons just can't randomly come and affect the dreams. Um, but if the, you know, if the, the, the believer, if demons can in, in do that and disturb the dreams. But we, that's how we protect our minds with the word of God and prayer and then they they can't trouble us thank you thank you pastor kiran did that answer your question yes okay thank you and uh yes we have a question from charles yeah how best can one explain to a young adult who asks which people was Cain fearing to whom he was fearing when he was being sent away if their family was the first to be created, uh, where did Cain get his wife? Yes, there are about three questions in this. Uh, can I ask any of our faculty to please take this question? Pastor. You would like to take this question, Pastor? Yeah, um, so, uh, okay, who was Cain fearing when he was sent away? The family was first to be created, where did Cain get his wife? All right, so um, Charles, this is just um, a pretty simple, simple, a simple thought process. Uh, you know, remember in those days, people lived many, many, many years. So Adam and, Adam and Eve had Cain and Abel. And uh, that doesn't mean they didn't have uh, other children. And so uh, they, Cain, Abel, Seth, and so many others, right? And then uh, uh, in those days, uh, uh, in those days, God, because this was the beginning of the human race and things were in a much purer state than they are today. In, in God's design, there was no problem at, at that time in intermarrying, uh, you know, uh, people born, from, say Adam and Eve say, we don't know exactly oh, how many children Adam and Eve had. They may have had two, I mean, uh, we know Cain and Abel and Seth, but we don't know. They could have had many more. Uh, not could have, they would have had many more because they had to have girls born. And uh, so in God's plan and in God's design, it was perfectly okay for um, Cain or Abel or, you know, the other males who were born of Adam and Eve to 
marry the females, the ladies who were born of Adam and Eve. That's God, that was God's design because obviously this was the beginning of the human race and God did not say it was wrong. And um, that was part of the plan. So it's just normal thought process that it was okay to do that. And that's, what, that's exactly what would have happened, right? Uh, where would the girls have come from? They would obviously come from Adam and Eve. And so obviously the males who were born of Adam and Eve married the females who were born of Adam and Eve. And then the human race started and so on. Now, whom was Cain fearing? He was obviously fearing the rest of the people who were born. Uh, and remember, uh, Cain and Abel, you know, when that happened, we don't know exactly what age it was, you know. Uh, if, for example, if Cain and Abel were 25, age 25, when, or somewhere around that, when Cain killed Abel, that means 25 years would have elapsed. I'm just saying example. I'm not saying that's the age. We don't know. 20, uh, 25 years would have elapsed, which means there would have been many other human beings born off of Adam and Eve in those 25 years. You know, so there was already people on, on, on the earth. Um, and uh, so Cain had a mark put on him by God. Uh, and so Cain was fearing not only God, but also the rest of the community who wanted justice for Abel, who had been killed. So I think this is just normal thought process. Um, it is uh, it's not uh, very difficult to think that, hey, that's how things started. You know, and uh, over time, over time, once the race, human race expanded, then later on God brought in rules uh, to, you know, to determine who, you know, how marriage should happen and so on. Is that okay, Charles? Charles, did that answer Still your question? Still trying to digest it. Did okay. <laughs> All right, Charles, no problem. Take your time. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for explaining in detail. And thank you, Charles. Well, we have two questions, one from Rupa and the others from Sid. Um, can anyone explain Rupa's question related to Job and his friend, his friends? Pastor Nancy, Paul, Asta, can you please explain uh, this question mm. for Rupa, please? Yeah. yeah. So um, the answer is um, yes, we can read and quote uh, what these people have, the friends of Job spoke about uh, with, with this qualifier that um, So all, everything that they've spoken is recorded in the scriptures for us. Job's four friends, whatever they spoke, it's all been recorded. Uh, it does not mean that everything they said is completely wrong in the sense that there were statements they made which were true about God. As far as who God is, in a generic sense. For example, if today, if some uh, a Hindu comes and tells me, God is great, which which is a common phrase, uh, yeah, he's a Hindu, or a Muslim, or somebody who's who's not of the faith, and he says God is great. Well, it's true. God is great. That's not a wrong statement. It's a true statement. Uh, he may not be a believer, but that's a generic statement, and that statement is true. God is great. Uh, so. In that sense, 
you know, we can look at portions of scripture. I mean, things that these people said, as long as they are in harmony with the rest of scriptures, yeah, it's fine because those are true statements. But where they went wrong is in their assessment, overall assessment of what was happening in Job's life. And if you look at, and if you look at basically the essence of what they were saying is, Job, you have sinned, you have done wrong things, and God is punishing you for the wrong you've done, the essence of, if, of all their arguments. But in the process of coming to that conclusion, they stated things that were generically right about God. So that's okay. Uh, but then we recognize that the essence of what they were saying, what they were getting at is was wrong in the sense of trying to say, Job, uh, you are being punished for your sins. And that's why uh, 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 God is doing this to you. And God said, that's not right. And it's not God who is punishing Job for uh, his wrongdoing. And Job, you know, often, you see Job, in his responses, he was actually forced to speak more about his own righteousness. It sometimes it makes look makes makes it look like Job is being self-righteous, but he is stating over and over again, you know, I've been clean. I haven't done anything wrong uh, before God, you know, but they are trying to bring that on Job. So in that sense, they were speaking wrong about God. So to answer your question, as long as it, it is in harmony with the rest of scriptures, we can. But um, do we need to do it? I don't think we need to do it simply because we can just use the rest of scriptures uh, to, to affirm those same truths. Thank you, Pastor. Rupa, did that answer your question? Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. It has answered. Yes, yes. It's clear Thank now. You. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Pastor, we have Sid's question. Uh, I keep it open to Pastor Nancy, Paul, or anyone who would like to take up Sid's question on demonology. Okay, uh, I think I'll very briefly uh, uh, make a comment yes. actually, not uh, not necessarily answer your question, Sid. Uh, so, uh, you know, beyond what you've asked, uh, I just feel like, uh, you know, the, the the spiritual authority which we have as believers, you know, it's far greater than than any demonic presence or uh, you know any manifestation of a demon. Um, so, just want to encourage uh, encourage you that. You know, take authority in the name of Jesus. We know that Jesus has conquered. Jesus has defeated uh, Satan on the cross of Calvary. Okay, and uh, uh, we are walking in that authority. So, uh, because I, as you mentioned, that you know you didn't sleep for about four to five days because of um, you know the dog barking. So just take authority. Uh, over uh, any demonic presence. Now, can dogs see demons? Uh, I really don't know. Uh, but yes, if there is any any demonic influence, we have the authority to overcome that sin. So that's my brief comment I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, Pastor, you would like to add to it? Uh, yeah, the dog barking at night sometimes maybe just the dog wants to sleep inside the house, not, not outside. So maybe a simple solution is bring the dog inside or train the dog to sleep. Uh, you know, uh, so I don't think we should uh, get too much uh, too spiritual about it. Um, can can animals see spirits into the spirit world? Um, the answer is yes, but not all the time. For example, you know, Balaam's donkey saw the angel but the prophet himself couldn't see the angel, but the donkey saw the angel. Uh, does that mean all donkeys always see in the spirit world? No, but God uh, at times would open their eyes. But on the same on the same token, demons can trouble animals. We know, so demons, you know, Satan came in the form of a serpent. Demons were cast into pigs, and they. You know, they ran and jumped into the water. So can demons uh, trouble animals? Yes. Uh, but how do we deal with it? You know, uh, like Nancy said, one is we just take our authority and deal with it. 
uh, and second is we you know sometimes the solution actually is just a small practical solution bring the dog and keep him sleep let him sleep inside the house uh, he'll sleep quietly uh, some maybe he's hungry or i don't know so some some basic problems <laughs> simple things like that may keep the dog from making noise at night yeah but i don't think we should always associate the dog crying at night with presence of demonic spirits that's not uh, necessarily true is that okay sir yes pastor thank you for the clarity thank you thank you pastor thank you pastor thank you sir for the question and uh, yeah as it's time up we can wind our session uh, we have a uh, a prayer request from uh, praise report i could say from her but that is we pray for his arm and his arm is getting better gradually so as we close the session and pray we can also pray for uh, herbert for his complete recovery well I, I, i'll pray dear god we thank you we praise you we love you lord thank you that you were there in midst of us lord thank you for the wonderful questions that we are able to clarify it and learn from each other father thank you lord thank you father for who you are in midst of us lord father we also lift up herbert in your hand we thank you for your healing over him oh father thank you for your hand of mercy and grace upon him and completely heal him the arm that is um that is uh, frozen and he was unable to move thank you father for your healing you are a god our healer you are jehovah rafa our god our healer thank you for the complete restoration lord thank you jesus in jesus name we pray amen thank you so much for joining in today's session god bless see you all tomorrow i mean in the you uh, yeah you all can continue with the classes Thank you. Thank you. God bless.